Good morning to everybody. Good to be with you. Good to see you. Uh, I'm just so aware of God's presence here. God is here among us, and I know that He's just doing something special in all our hearts. And um, just want to say thank you to the worship team just for the amazing work that you guys do every single Sunday. We love you guys. Well, we kick-started our series, Choose Courage and Adventure Awaits, and I believe this is a prophetic theme for us personally as well as corporately as a church. And so what we're doing over the next two weeks is unpacking this word courage. Last week we said courage means choosing adventure, that there are certain moments and experiences that God wants us to embrace, to seize, not to miss the moments that He has for us, making certain moments and also enjoying moments. And uh, today we're going to look at another angle, another view of courage. I'm excited about our next series, Frequency, that's starting in two weeks' time, uh, three weeks' time, and that's called Frequency. I think it's a desire for every single one of us how to hear God's voice clearly, and it's so crucial for us in uh, our prophetic theme for the 2018, Choosing Courage, comes also by knowing and hearing God's voice. And so we're going to unpack that together. It was about three years ago, it was on a Saturday afternoon, no one was here, I walked into this building, and um, I actually sat right here, looked at an empty building, empty chairs, and said these words, this is me, this is Chris. And there was a desire in my heart just to grow to be more myself, more of myself, just to be real, warts and all, recognizing sometimes in ministry, and maybe for some of us as Christians, we always feel this pressure to always be perfect. When we look at our lives, we realize how uh, far short we fall and that there's struggles and imperfections and uh, things that I've dealt with and dealing with. And when I look back in certain areas of my life that they've caused some shame. And one of our values at New Life Church is authenticity that no perfect people are allowed, that come as you are, and that we, uh, but we don't stay as we are, that we're all in this journey of growing together, but that uh, vulnerability and, and being real and authentic is so crucial uh, for our freedom and our wholeness and our healing and also reaching our full potential in God. I remember uh, picking up a book by the name of, uh, called, it's, it, I thought it was just me, written by uh, a research professor called Brene Brown. And um, she spoke around the whole idea of many of us, how we struggle with shame of not being enough or the fear of not being enough. And sometimes we're so afraid of uh, letting our true selves be seen and known. And there's a choice in our lives. So often we can live our lives from shame or live our lives from a place of worthiness. And that when we begin to do that, live our lives instead of living from shame but worthiness, we begin to embrace some of those real aspects of our lives, our imperfections, as well as some of our struggles and some of our weaknesses. And we realize that our, 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 our vulnerabilities are, are not weaknesses, but they what connect us. Also realizing our imperfections are also what just remind us that every single one of us are human beings, works in progress. And I, uh, I also realize that for many of us, we need to grow into understanding that we are worthy of love, worthy of belonging, worthy of connection. I was quite moved last year. It was at the end of the service, and uh, a young strong man, strong guy, came to me, and I could see the anguish in his eyes. I could see he was wrestling with some stuff, and he just said, Chris, I'd just like to meet with you. So that week, uh, I don't do much counseling, but I, I connected with him, Ryan and I, and um, he just began to share a little bit of his struggles and just what was, what was happening in his life, a bit about his journey. And I could see that as he was about to open up, that there was this sense of shame about what he was going to share with us. And um, during the conversation, we were just so aware of the Holy Spirit there and just the compassion that was flowing and that we were able to pray with Him and we just rejoiced at what the Lord is doing in His life. And when I sat there, I realized this is a guy that is choosing courage. He could have just stayed quiet, but in this moment, he was choosing courage and he was prepared to be vulnerable. And that in being vulnerable, he was showing courage and also uh, allowing God to do something unique in his life. Now, the title of today's message is Courage is Being Vulnerable and Relational. 
So often we look at the word courage <clears throat> and we think of William Wallace and Braveheart. Now, I love the movie uh, Braveheart. I love Gladiator. I love those kind of movies. And uh, so often we, we, we associate courage with being the hero, like William Wallace or being Superman or, or Wonder Woman. And th thank God for heroes. It's important that we have heroes. But another side of it is we've lost touch with the idea of what just true courage is all about, ordinary courage. And that in the old days, when they used the word courage, it came from this Latin word core, and the root of the word courage is core, which means heart. It means heart. And that the idea of courage is learning to be authentic, learning to be you, learning to live from the heart, learning to speak one's mind by telling one's heart. It's learning to speak honestly about who we are and also about what we're feeling and about our experiences and our struggles and some of our imperfections, good and bad. And so when we look at a hero like William Wallace, he's the guy who's prepared to put his life on the line. But the other side of ordinary courage is also people that are prepared to put their vulnerability on the line. And that as we do that, an adventure awaits God begins to do some special things as we, instead of living fragmented lives and split in different ways and feeling I'm, I'm unworthy of love and acceptance and belonging, all of a sudden the Lord begins to do a work as we choose courage by following the Holy Spirit. I think, the, you know, every one of us can see courage in different ways. You kind of think of those moments when you're in school or in the boardroom, but yeah, the teacher's teaching something and it's a concept that you're kind of not getting in that moment and you feel a little too embarrassed to raise your hand and say, listen, please, can you, I, I'm lost. And there's quite a few of you sitting in the room feeling the same thing, but any, all of a sudden somebody chooses courage and being vulnerable and, and is willing to take the risk of looking maybe stupid in that moment, but he raises his hand and says, teacher, please, I, I'm lost. I, I need you just to clarify this. And all of a sudden, the other 10 that were too afraid to raise their hands, they feel a sense of relief, think, thank goodness somebody was prepared to be brave enough to ask the question, and it's actually helped us all. Which tells us something, that sometimes your brave can be someone else's breakthrough. Sometimes when you prepare just to step out and be vulnerable and relational, as we're going to see today, it actually can not, only, it not only helps you, letting go of what people think about you, which is so hard but also beginning to embrace who you are and it begins to help others find breakthroughs. The fear of man is a big snare for many of us. And I think it's a journey in our lives for us to still love people but realize don't allow the fear of man to be that trap to hold you back from reaching your purpose. But rather for us to fear God, to reverentially respect him, love him, be in awe of him, understand how big he is and that serve him and understand that he wants to allow you to see the beginning of wisdom is in knowing him and loving him above all things, preferring him above everything. And so when we're courageous, what happens, we're willing to, to, to risk to being vulnerable and, and, and acknowledge some of the stuff, acknowledge some of the, the, the issues that we're dealing with, some of our imperfections and struggles and not just try to be perfect and keep this whole perfect persona going, because why? Because some of us are feeling ashamed that, hey, listen, if I stepped out and got help, well, then someone might reject me and criticize me. It might, you know, hurt me in the process. When we look at courage, we realize courage uh, is also being prepared to get help when it would be easier to pretend. To say, listen, I can conceal this thing or otherwise I can actually step out and get help from the right people. Just on courage, there's other aspects of courage we don't have time to get into, but courage, another aspect of courage is staying when it would be easy to leave. When the circumstances in your life just says run, just go, but God says stay, it's in those moments that you've got to make a decision. Listen, if I start running now, I may never stop running. And so it's to stay the course, to, 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 to be steadfast in what the, the Lord is calling you to do. There's other times when courage actually says it's leaving when it would be easy to stay. And courage is also speaks of submitting when it would be easier just to rebel and power up. 
So there's different aspects of courage, but today we're leaning in more to the idea of this whole thing of living from your heart and not living a fragmented life and owning your story, embracing who you are and owning your story and just being real to who you are and the work that the Lord is doing in you. It can be hard, but it's not as difficult as spending our lives running from it. Realizing, hey, listen, there's certain things in my life that are part of my story and they bring shame, but I, I need to recognize the forgiveness and cleansing of God and also realize that God turns everything for good if I will just love him and follow his purpose and be led by him. And so sometimes what holds us back from living wholehearted lives, a place of worthiness, of, that, you're worth of, that you're worthy of love and connection, belonging, is fear and shame keeps us back. Lee and I were at a conference at Gateway in Dallas last year, church conference, and Louis Giglio, who's just a phenomenal communicator, a lovely man, and heads up this amazing movement called Passion, helping young adults around the world, varsity students, and he packed stadiums. He was at Loftus uh, about two, three years ago, packed the stadium, and running a great church, great author, great bands. I mean, everything's just going well for him. And yet he gets up this day, this is last year, and he begins to share a little bit about his story. Just gets real. He says this, hey guys, about two years ago, I was just going through some stuff, and he just said I started facing depression. All of a sudden I had to go on medication, and he says, hey, listen, everything was going well for me, but I just couldn't seem to get victory in this thing. And he says he got help and, and, he, and, and how the Lord helped him through the whole process. And it was for a season that he was going through all this stuff but got through it. But, was, but what was Louis doing there? He was, he was choosing courage. He was being vulnerable. And in that, just by him choosing courage, his brave was, was bringing a breakthrough to others. It was actually helping others that maybe were facing something else, so facing the same thing and just thinking, wow, if Louis can go through that kind of stuff, well then, listen, there's also hope for me. And, and so there was a compassion and, and a connection in the room and, and there was just a love there and also encouragement as he was just prepared to be vulnerable around his story. You know, a, a single act of courage is often the catalyst to extraordinary that your brave is someone else's breakthrough. And sometimes first it's for you, it's for me, and then for those around us. Some of us know the, the story, true story about Rosa Parks in 1955, he gets on a bus and she sits on a seat which is supposed to be for whites only and she refuses to get off that seat. And from her courageous act, what happens, it was the catalyst to the civil rights movement in America. And things changed as a result of one lady saying, listen, I want to be brave in this moment. And so courage for us has this ripple effect. Every time we choose courage, we make everyone around us feel a little better and also the world a little braver. And I think we can do with a little bit more kindness and compassion in this world, so much hatred and criticism and also some more bravery. And we're gonna understand in this world that people don't follow titles, they follow courage. And so sometimes in this context of courage, what holds us back is shame for some of us. And it's an intensely painful feeling or experience that we, that we are flawed and therefore unworthy of acceptance and belonging and connection because of some stuff that's either been done to you or that you've done yourself. And it's interesting when you look at the difference between guilt, all of us know what it is to feel guilty and think, oh, what I did there was so wrong. And that, that, was, that was sin, or I did something wrong and I made a mistake, but what shame does is it begins to personalize it, personalize it, and all of a sudden, I am a bad person. This is something wrong with me, I'm not good enough, I am a mistake. And so, because we feel this, this area of imperfection and this, the, these flaws in us, we feel totally inadequate, and, and then what it does is it opens the door to self-hatred and we start disliking ourselves. And as a result, start disliking people around us. And so we live in this shame culture that's always throwing these social expectations of, 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 of that, that being imperfect, being imperfect actually means that you're totally inadequate and that you're weak. And so what we do is we spend a lot of time trying to manage perceptions of 
editing, carefully editing versions of ourselves so that we can be fully accepted by people. And also what happens is we hide our struggles and protect ourselves from judgment and criticism and shame by, by, by seeking safety in pretense and perfection. So the more perfect I look, then more people accept me. So I can't let go. I can't, I can't show that there's some crack here or some imperfection or some struggle or something about my life that needs help. And all of a sudden realize that, hey, listen, we're all in this. So one of our values is no, 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 no perfect people allowed. We want to embrace authenticity, which is a crucial part, I believe, of walking in the light. There's this thing called the stronghold, that sometimes these are areas, lies that we have constructed within our own minds over time, and there's the shame, fear, control stronghold that the Lord wants to break free, to, to make that chain snap in our own lives, that we would not be governed by shame, but a sense of love and compassion and worthiness. So often we're filled with shame, and so we're fearful, and then we try and control things, and then we're going to try and put on this image that, hey, listen, I've got my whole act together, but this is not really who I am. I'm needing Jesus just like you. So the greatest challenge for most of us is believing that we're worthy right now. And it's funny, when it comes to this worth, this value, so often worthiness has these requisites or these, these prerequisites, these conditions that I'll be worthy when I've, when, I've, when I've lost 20 kilograms. I'll be worthy when I've got those killer abs. I'll, I'll be worthy when I can fall pregnant or I'll be worthy when I can get or stay sober or I'll be worthy... When, uh, when, I, when I'm a, a good parent, a perfect parent, so I'll be worthy when I can pull this whole marriage together. I'll be worthy if she accepts my invitation to go on a date. And so there's all these prerequisites, these all these different conditions that we set up ourselves to just hurt, more hurt. And what we got to realize as a child of God, that you are worthy right now. Worthy of his love and acceptance all because of his grace and, and that you're, you're worthy of that love. Uh, there was a doctor called Dr. Hartland who focused in and around shame and, he, and he's talked about how we deal with shame. Different people uh, dif- deal with shame differently. Get some people, what they do is they move away from people by withdrawing, by just isolating themselves, silencing themselves and, and because afraid that people will see a little bit of who they are. And then there's some people that what they do is they, they move toward people and become people pleasers and always wanting to please people so that they'll be accepted. And then other people who, who move against others. And, and what they're great at doing is try to gain power over others. And they're all about shaming and blaming. Why? Because there's a part within them that they're feeling their own sense of shame and their own sense of blame. And so shame often is about fear. Sometimes we've got this shame-based identity. And we're afraid that people won't like us if they know the truth about us. And we've got some imperfections and in actual fact that none of us are perfect except Jesus. And it's one of the reasons why we need him to help us and encourage us and equip us. We feel that, hey, people will reject us if they knew a little bit about us. And in times, and this is, it causes some troubles with our own relation to the Lord, we feel like, hey, God's far from us, when in actual fact, he's not ashamed of you, that he is the one that's prepared to live in you by his spirit, all made possible through the cross, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, that he's here to be near you, in you, and that he cares for you, and loves you, and wants to help you and me, and that he's not ashamed of you, but loves you. So, shame loves secrecy. Shame loves darkness. Shame never wants you to risk that vulnerability and say, listen, go and get help or just start developing a kind of safe relationship where you can begin just to learn just to be who you are. Realizing, hey, listen, we works in progress. I believe the cure for shame is, is walking in the light, beginning to break and snap the pain or, or the power chain of shame. Beginning to grow in a, in, a, in, a, in a real, authentic relationship with a God that deeply loves you and me. And knowing that you're his child, that you're his son and his daughter, that's so crucial. That we'd live out of that revelation. That we'd know our title, that our title is son and daughter of God. 
that he's our deep, lo- he's our good loving father. He loves each one of us and wants to help us and affirm us in our identities. Identities that say, listen, you're a person of worth, of love, and I affirm you. Listen to what Romans 9 verse 33 says, the one who believes in him will never be put to shame. And this is an ongoing process as I'm growing in my relationship with Jesus and as he's working in me and healing me, what happens is I'm realizing shame doesn't have to be it doesn't have to be part of my identity. Psalms 34 verse five says, those who look to him are radiant. Their faces are never covered with shame. And so this is where as followers of Christ, what we're gonna do is lean into this whole idea that none of us are immune to this whole idea of shame and condemnation because we've all blown it in some way or another. Some of us have got to the place where the Lord has caused a beautiful healing and you're on that, you're on that journey and it's, it's exciting. But for some of us, sometimes we live with the weight and condemnation of shame and, con- and, 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 and the condemnation is crippling. And what it can do is it can make us so insecure and uncertain in terms of our relationship with the Lord. And then sometimes we feel like, listen, I can never really be used by God because of some of my imperfections and my struggles. And God says, listen, I want to help you with those. But I need you to walk in the light with me. And the enemy, the Satan, the Bible says his name means accuser. And he will accuse you in our day and night. Until we make a decision, you know what, I've realized shame, it feeds in darkness and secrecy, and, and it hates light. That as I'm prepared to live from my heart and actually step into light and be more truthful and honest about who I am and with the right people around me, all of a sudden, it breaks the power of shame and condemnation. That we don't have to feel it if we, and, and feel its power if we begin to embrace truth. Because Jesus said, you'll know the truth, and the truth will set us free. And so the more truthful, he is light. God is light. He is truth. And so the more we embrace him and begin to walk in the light, the more he begins to help us and that confidence begins to emerge. And there's certain words that I believe the Holy Spirit wants to reveal to you and I as we embrace courage. Listen to these words from John, 1 John 1 verse 7. He says this, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another that fellowship, that fellowship with you so you're not disintegrated, that we're beginning to be whole people, free people, and also that the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. John will also say this in two verses later. He'll say, listen, if we confess our sin, in other words, if we'll just open up about some of our stuff, sometimes it's not just sin, sometimes it's just some struggles or things that we're dealing with. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so what we're gonna realize in this so often when it comes to shame, shame likes concealment, whereas God wants us to embrace truth and honesty and light, and that's that confession part, that I begin to just agree with what God is saying about certain things in my life, but I don't shy away from it, I lean in it because it's there to help me. And then listen to what Paul the Apostle, this was a guy that could have had, he had every reason to be riddled with shame because of what he had done to the church of Jesus Christ before he had encounter with the Lord. He said this, there is therefore now no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus. There's no condemnation. Condemnation speaks of judgment that's coming down on a person. It's like this accuser that continuously condemns and just judge, 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 criticize, criticize. And sometimes we those people. We allow that voice of criticism and judgment to rise and the enemy doesn't even have to do it. We do it well on ourselves. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna grab hold of these words, Jesus' words that are spirit and life and and he's wanting us to know, listen, if we'll confess and we'll just open up and begin to walk in the light. The Bible even talks about it as we confess our faults to one another, we can be healed, be made whole, be free. And so what happens is I begin to embrace Jesus' words, his words that bring freedom. I realize, hey, listen, he's heard my, my request for forgiveness, that I am a person that's cleansed and freed from the clutches of condemnation. I've just got to begin owning it. And then also that I'm, a wor- I'm worthy of, of his love and worthy of his acceptance all because of his grace. Why? Because I'm beginning to walk in light. And so this is a process for, for, for some of us here. And then what we also realize that courage is learning to overcome shame. It's learning to overcome shame. And for some of us, as I said even last week, some of our journeys are gonna be inward this year and also outward. 
Some of them might be geographical, new le- levels, new positions, and all that stuff. But for some of us, the Lord also wants to do a deeper work within us. And that's going to require courage that we prepare to own up and walk in the light and say, God, I need to own a little bit of my story and begin to live from the heart. And it requires me, yes, realizing that certain things I can't change in my past. But Lord, that you will act redemptively and work it that I would begin to learn lessons that help me and also help others going forward. And so Shabin keeps worthiness away by convincing us that owning our stories, that being real, being authentic will lead people to think less of us. But in actual fact, many people actually respect us more and be more compassionate. And when we ignore our story, the more you distance yourself from the story, the more you distance yourself from yourself, the more shame we feel. And so owning our story Stopping the pretense to always be perfect and always have it together is sometimes the bravest thing that we can do, but it's liberating, and it's amazing. And yes, sometimes it can be a bit hard in the process, but I tell you, it's worth it. And so you've got a story, and we, Jesus is the author and finisher of our faith. He's, he's writing a beautiful story through us, and sometimes there are things where we haven't obeyed him, and we've, we've bumped against some of the consequences of that, but we've seen his forgiveness and help us and restore us and heal us. And that that, that the Bible is just one beautiful storybook of a God that just loves people and just wants to be in relationship with them and help them understand the beautiful purpose that he has for them. And then you begin to look at from Genesis to Revelation, just stories of just men and women, ordinary people who've had some struggles and imperfections, some good moments and miraculous moments and also some moments of valley experiences. You begin to realize that, wait a minute, I also have a story, you have a story, and that it's one area that none of us have to compete with the other person. That, that, hey, listen, you get an A for your story. I get an A for my story. It's your story, and that by you and I opening and and owning our stories, it, it opens up all kinds of possibilities. And I tell you this. It it confirms what even Revelation says where it talks about the enemy, how we overcome the enemy's plans, that there's a liar, deceiver, tempter who's set on your destruction of mine. But Jesus says, I've come to give you life. And it says they overcame him, the blood, by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. And that's understand that you've, it's your testimony, it's your story. Hey, listen, once I was lost, but now I'm found. And that in that, God's beginning to do a redemptive, restorative, freeing work within you and me as I'm beginning to walk in the light and become more vulnerable and know that God works all things together for good. Now, am I saying that you need to come up here and grab a microphone and share every struggle and every imperfection and everything that has caused you some pain, things that have been done to you or you've done to yourself or others? No, but it's to find a safe place, firstly with the Lord and just getting real before Him. And then the Lord begins to develop relationships in your life where you begin to think, okay, this is a place where I can now stop pretending to be perfect. What's interesting is when somebody shares their story with you, isn't it amazing how compassion is awoken in us? When we no longer are critical of people and their struggles and their imperfections and all of a sudden you see the bravery and the courage in it that it, it's taken them, that all of a sudden compassion comes. But for some people, what happens, instead of compassion, there's a harsh criticism that comes. And sometimes it comes from a place of resentment or criticism that you have for yourself. And sometimes in those moments, I feel I'm worried I'll be criticized or rejected if I really open up and begin to really choose courage and be vulnerable and live from my heart. Because God does, God can do work in light. And so what we're going to do is we're going to amp up the volume, the voice of compassion instead of the voice of criticism. Say, Lord, I wanna allow the voice of compassion because Lord, I realize the heart of courage is loving and accepting and being compassionate to myself as well as to others. That the Lord looks on you kindly, that he looks on you compassionately. And that I realize, God, that you love me. Yes, Lord, there's some certain things I've done that I'm not proud of, but God, you love me anyway. And Lord, that you're here to forgive and cleanse. And Lord, that you help me realize I'm not perfect. But Lord, as I'm following you, you've begun a good work in me. And that you'll be faithful to complete it. And Lord, that I'm, I'm worthy of love. And so that I've got to realize, I've got to learn to practice compassion and acceptance. And begin to accept myself. And in that, also begin accepting others. And be compassionate to those around me who are also facing similar struggles or different struggles. And have different imperfections. But this is what connects us. 
And we realize, hey, listen, that we're gonna be kind to ourselves and also be kind to others. And this is the way that Jesus wants us to be. And that what's interesting is when somebody begins to share a little bit of their struggle, you can relate to it because you realize, hey, wait a minute, it's not just me. That this is shared humanity. And even like Honey was talking about earlier, earlier about Ubuntu, that compassion becomes real when we recognize our shared humanity, that we're in this together, that every one of us human beings, all needing the grace and the love and the power of Jesus Christ to help us in the journey. But that when you begin to see a compassionate person at work, what you realize there's no judgment. I don't think when the G- Jesus was with the woman at the well, and she said, I've had five husbands, and, but Jesus, you don't see criticism, you don't see judgment, you see a heart of compassion, but helping her discover her full purpose in him. So many different stories where you see Jesus operating that, that way and that we recognize a truly compassionate person is willing to also stand in the struggle with you, so to speak, not there to try and fix you, but standing as an equal and saying, listen, we're in this together. I like you, I'm also human and have my struggles and imperfections. And so compassion, I believe that starts by us beginning to have a deep relationship with the Lord and also beginning to have a relationship with yourself and obviously others. Listen to the great commandments. Jesus said this. This is what we're gonna just keep on working on day in and day out. This is what he asked us to do. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself. So often we're just thinking of loving God, loving others, and we neglect ourselves. And I believe the holistic view of the great commandment is first God. God is always first. We're seeking him first. And then out of that, realizing that, Lord, you love me first, and I love you back, Lord. And I just want to keep on serving you, loving you. Lord, work in me. And Lord, as I'm receiving your love, Lord, I realize you love me and you look on me kindly. And Lord, also I need to look on others kindly and compassionately. It's part of our mission, which is inspiring everyone to love God, to love others as ourselves and impact the world for Christ. And then look what us, Romans 15 verse 7 says, therefore accept, accept each other as Christ has accepted you so that God will be given glory. And so guys, for us, we're gonna just get to that place where you embrace compassion and allow the Spirit of God to reveal to your heart and my heart, hey, listen, that you're a loved person, that you're worthy of his love. And yes, there are gonna be moments in our journey where our, it's the Holy Spirit's job to convict. It's God's job to judge, but he's a merciful judge, and it's, not, it's our job just to love, to grow in love, not to say that we can't evaluate things and speak the truth in love, but realize in our journey, the Holy Spirit's gonna convict us of certain things. Not try and condemn us, but in that moment out of love for us because he knows that sin hurts us. And so he's gonna convict us and in that moment to realize, okay, Lord, I'm gonna work on that. Lord, I need to repent of that. I need to confess that thing and I need help in that. And, and then if, there's, if that's not happening, then you just keep on just serving Jesus and just loving him and worshiping him. And then finally, compassion, I believe, opens the door also to community. It opens the door to true connection. When you've been courageous enough to be vulnerable with somebody and they've just shared a little bit of their story, a little bit of their struggle or the imperfection, what happens is you feel deeply connected with the person. Because why you feel seen, valued, and heard in that moment with there's no judgment that's going, there's no criticism that's flowing. And, and even though it was maybe a little scary at the moment, all of a sudden you leave that experience feeling more deeply connected with the person you shared the issue with. And the person on the receiving end is also relieved because they sit there and think to myself, wait a minute, you know what? I also have struggles. We're in this together. And so connection begets connection. And so what we gotta realize is trying to live a totally independent life and a self-sufficient life is not part of God's plan or agenda and actually works against our healing and freedom and wholeness. And God, God never created us to be alone. When you even look at the Trinity, God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, it speaks of this beautiful, harmonious, peaceful relationship that we have been created to actually do life together and that we need that connection. But sometimes it's our shame and our guilt that keeps us disconnected. And we're living in a world that's so disconnected, even though there's so much technology around us and nothing against Facebook, 
But so often we feel like, because we have so many friends on Facebook, well, we're just more connected. When in actual fact, that's not the connection that we're speaking of here, that we all need. We need that community. God's created us and wired us for connection. In fact, when we were born, we need connection to thrive emotionally and intellectually and spiritually. We need it. 1 John says this, if we walk in the light as he is in light, we have fellowship with one another. I believe we want that true connection with, with brothers and sisters, people that we're on the same page together and we're beginning to work together in our journey and that we don't feel like we've got to do it alone. I was watching a little TED talk uh, this last week and this professor who's been researching health and one of the greatest predictors of longevity and she talked about health and exercise and all those kind of things, but the two top predictors of people that live longer lives are people that have close relationships and social interaction. This is, this is, this is professors researching the subject over years in people's lives, and so I believe it's so important for every one of us just to understand our need for connection, and sometimes the thing that's keeping us back is that we're not choosing courage because we don't want to be vulnerable in relationships. It's said today that in America, Americans are lonely than ever. Lonelier than ever. New York City, which pumps and is a buzz, but they say how it's known as a very lonely city. So I believe that the Lord wants to help us, give us, give us courage to develop connection and belonging. And we need to also know that people are very hard to hate when they close up. So often we putting people at a distance and think, well, I'm gonna really, they, we really criticize people, but I tell you, when you let people in your life, people and begin to get real with them, you find that people are very hard to hate when they close up. Why? Because we begin to see our own humanity, our own story in their eyes. Also the importance of what it is to walk with Jesus and how important he is to all of us. And so connection is that, that, like that, that, that moment where people feel they're seen, valued, and hurt, and where we, you, give, you give no judgment. It is receiving no judgment, and there's this whole thing where there's this strength and connection that's beginning to grow. The good news is that community is a gift that God offers to pour love out on all of us. And I believe that we need, even when we look at the early church, I believe the reason why they were so strategic and powerful is because they'd meet in homes and they'd get together. Like today, it would be, be a cup of chino with some mates or I'd be praying together, I'd like our small groups, worshiping together, praying together, learning the Bible together. Um, so important for us that Jesus says, where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am amongst them. And this is where we begin to see Jesus at work when we just prepare to take that next step and get involved and become a bit more relational and understand the value of spiritual community and connection. So important for all of us. So understand what it is sometimes when we're filled with shame that we disconnect and we pull back and isolate. God's saying, let's choose courage, move forward. So my prayer for all of us is that we would choose courage, that we'd choose to be honest, that we'd choose to let our true selves be seen, to show up and be real, that we'd choose compassion to ourselves and others around us, and that we'd also practice connection. The more you do it, you know, it's like swimming. The more you swim as a young guy, the, the more you get better at swimming. Well, with courage, the more you're couraging, the more you step out and act courageously and act compassionately and act in, the, in, in that connection, what happens, it just begins to work together for good. So I believe the Lord is calling us to be an authentic church, authentic people, realizing, hey, listen, none of us are perfect, but we're all on this journey and that Jesus is working in us so that we would begin to embrace his grace and his truth and that we would practice courage in a culture of, culture of shame, understanding the true message of the gospel that we would practice compassion in a culture of blame, and that we would practice connection in a culture of disconnection. That we'd learn it's the power of overcoming shame, walking the light, living from the heart, owning your story, and that your brave is someone else's breakthrough. Let's pray. Just as our heads are bowed, what is the Lord saying to you this morning? What thought, what picture? What is he saying to you personally 
if I choose courage because an adventure awaits you. God has beautiful things in store for us. Wants us to walk free, wants to let go of that pressure of who we think we're supposed to be. Just get real and walk in the light and let his light begin doing a transformative work in us. Jesus, when you walked this earth, people saw your authenticity, that you were real, that you were compassionate, that you were connected, that you were courageous. Lord, help us in this journey. Lord, let us own up to certain things where we need assistance, have the courage to get help instead of just concealing things. Lord, we would speak to the right people, Lord, and just finding freedom, finding wholeness. Lord, that you'd give us perspective on the things that have been done in our past, Lord, things that have brought us shame, to understand that, Lord, that your blood cleanses us, and Lord, that you can use those moments, Lord, that were done to us, that we did to ourselves and others, Lord, to use them for your glory, lessons for your glory, Lord, lessons to help others and ourselves. Pray, Holy Spirit, that you would be the comforter, that you would be the one that brings us into the light. Lord, we would come out of those areas of darkness, Lord, and just enjoy the beauty, the freedom, the power of your truth and your light. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. As every head is bowed, maybe there's someone here and you've never begun a new life in Jesus. You've sensed this separation, this disconnect, because maybe it's been something we all relate to because of our own sin. And yet Jesus has come to be the Savior to forgive us of the sin, to reconcile us with God because that's what we've been created to be and do is to have relationship with Him. To be reconciled with Him for all eternity. That you can know that you're worthy, that you're right in His sight and that you don't have to live this shame game for all your lives. That you can accept His forgiveness, accept His new life, His power in you to fulfill the plan he's got for you. To understand why he came to the cross is for you, for me, for this world, because he loved us so much and he doesn't want us to perish, but he wants us to receive everlasting life. The life that God experiences, he wants you to experience that peace, that joy, that righteousness. Realizing that we're in this journey, but to know that the center of your being, that you have him. All you're gonna do is just humble yourself and say, Jesus, be my Savior. Be my Lord. Maybe some of you just need to say that. Just say, Jesus, save me from my sin. Jesus, be my Lord. Lead my life. I need your help. Lord, I open the door of my heart. And I welcome you in. Rule and reign in me, Jesus. Take control of my life. And make me into the person You've created me to be in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Can we give a big hand to those who've just humbled themselves and prayed their prayer of salvation?